Okay, let's look at an example of how to found steady state probability for a Markov chain. Now, first we remember steady state probability, this probability vector pi, is for an irreducible set of states. Let's look at this um, Markov matrix over here. We will first try to see why this defines an irreducible set of states. Now, in class, we said that you need to draw a state diagram and try to see if one state can go to every other state and come back. So we make sure that every state is irreducible and recurrent. Um, but here, there is a rather easy way to do that. Actually, that's going to be true for all irreducible set of states. You just need to pick one state and start from there to see if you can go around all states, make a cycle and come back. If you can do that, then it's going to be irreducible set of states. So for, for example, over here, let's say we start from state 4, um, and then we can see that state 4 can only go to state 1. Okay, that's fine. And state 1 can go to state 2 or 3 or 4. So we can say 1 can go to 3, right? And look at 2. 2 can go to 1, 2, 3. So 2 can go to 3, right? That should be fine. And 3 can go back to 4. Okay. So if you see, there is a cycle like this, and it goes through all states, then this is going to be an irreducible set of states. Okay. So now let's try to see how can we find the steady state probability for this Markov chain. So-called steady state probability, we can look at this way. We already know, um, suppose we start from, suppose we know that the first state x naught, and if we have a PMF, that means how likely these states are going to occur for the time zero step and then we say if you know a pmf you you not then we can find out we can find out um the next one pmf of x1 then we simply have mu not times p right and you can keep going for x2 then its pmf is going to be x not p squared and in general, xn, and then we have its PMF. It's going to be mu naught times p to the n. So, if we want to know, on average, how frequent these states occur, we just need to look at the entries of this vector. And if the entries over here are no longer changing, when n changes, it means that we have reached the steady state. So what we have over here, we are look for we are looking for a pi over here, the vector. So we have looking for a vector x1, say x4, and this is gonna be our row vector pi. So that if you look if you use this one as the PMF, then it's no longer changing. So that means that pi, if you multiply it by p, it's going to be remain as pi. So if x0 starts with pmf pi, then you will see this probability factor will remain the same all the time for all n. That's why this pi over here is called the steady state. Okay. It's a steady state. And the meaning of the steady state is that we have a irreducible set of states. And we can start from any one. If we run this Markov chain, we can ask the following question. On average, how frequent each state will occur over the time? Or we can ask the following thing. Say, given randomly a time, just n over here in the very far future, what we can say about the probability of each state to occur at that particular time. So that's the one we are looking at. 
and this pi is the one we want to find. Once we have understood this, solving pi is just a linear algebra problem, and we want to solve this equation over here using this example. Okay. So how do we do that? Remember pi is a row vector, but in linear algebra, we usually solve for column vector. So what we do is that we look at the transpose. So solve pi this way. Solve pi from this equation. Now we can put these two terms on one side. So it's going to be pi identity matrix minus p is equal to 0. This is the same thing as the equation. So if we want to make this system look like the systems we solved in linear algebra, we need to take the transpose. So what we need to do is that transpose this matrix I minus P. And when you transpose the identity matrix, it's still going to be the identity matrix. But when you transpose P, you will have P transpose. So this is going to be I minus P transpose. And then you put the vector over here becomes a vertical a column vector. Okay. So that's what we do. And if you look at it, this is what we have. So we have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is the identity matrix. And then mi minus the transpose of this one. So it becomes 0, 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. One third. And we have one third, one third, one third, and zero. And then we have zero, one half, zero, one half. Last column one zero zero zero. And we want to solve this system. So let's look at the coefficient matrix because we know we needed to row reduction. So we would just look at this matrix over here. So what we have here, the matrix, is now we have 1 and negative 1 third and 0, negative 1. That's the first row. And then we have negative 1 third. 1 minus 1 third is going to be 2 thirds. And then we have negative 1 half and 0. And the last one here, we have negative 1 third and negative one third, and then one minus zero is one, and zero minus zero is zero. And the last one here we have is negative one third, and zero, negative one half, and one. And we want to solve this system, so what we have over here is that x1, x2, x3, and x4, and is equal to zero. And because this P is a Markov matrix, we know that 1 is its eigenvalue. Because 1 is its eigenvalue, so 1 minus P is not invertible. We know that 1 minus P, the determinant, must be 0. Otherwise, we won't have non-zero solution for this homogeneous system. If the determinant is equal to 0, that means we have at least one free variable. In fact, we will have one free variable. If we have one free variable, that means we can just solve three equations, and then we get the solution. OK, so we just need to look at the first three. You can choose usually any three rows to work on, but it seems to us that we have a lot of zeros in the first three rows, so we're going to do that and two-thirds, and negative one-half, and zero, negative one-third, negative one-third, and one-zero. Now, remember the way we solve a system. We try to reduce it to row echelon form. Usually, we eliminate the entries, actually, over here. But for this matrix over here, since we already have two zeros in the last column, we are going to just eliminate this one over here, and then we will have a shortcut to solve it. So do the row reduction, 
what we're gonna do is try to eliminate this one over here. How do we do that? Um, we can use the second row, so multiplied by two to the second row. Let me see, two times row two, and then we get negative one over here. Then add two, add two, row three. Okay, so that's the row operation we are going to apply, and then this keeps this row is the same, no change. And this one over here, no change either. One third and two thirds, negative one half and zero. And then multiply negative one third by two, we get negative two thirds plus negative one third, so this is gonna be negative one. Okay. And then next one, two times two is four, four thirds minus one third is three thirds, so it's one over here. And this becomes zero, and this becomes zero. So now we look at the last row. What it means is negative x1 plus x2 is equal to zero, so we have x1 is equal to x2. So pretty straightforward. And then we look at the other two equations. We have x1 minus one third x2 minus x4 is equal to zero. That's from the first row. And then we have negative one third x1 plus two thirds x2 minus one half of x3 is equal to zero. We need to be very careful, otherwise we'll get trouble. So x1, x2 are the same, and then we have from the first equation, we can say um, two thirds of x1 is equal to x4. That's right. And then for the last one over here, negative one third plus two thirds is one third. So we can say one third of x1 is equal to one half of x3. Really, these two equations are the same thing. So what we have, we end up with the following. We say, okay, now um, we can use say x4 as a, if we use x4 as three, let's say, and then we will see the following thing, that um, 2x1 is going to be 3x4 and 2x1 is equal to 3x3. So really we have x3 is also equal to x4, right? And then we can choose a value for, for x4. If we see that, we can say choose x4. You can choose to be any non-zero value, but I see that if I choose x2 to be 2, then I have x1 is going to be 3. And then x2 is going to be also 3, and x3 is going to be 2. So we have the following solution. We have x1, x2, x3, x4, and is equal to 3, 3, and 2, and 2. Now, of course, we expect to get a positive vector, but if you look at this vector, it's not a probability vector. So how can we do that? We add up the entries and divide every entry by the sum. So pi over here, if you look at it, that's going to be the following. 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. So we have a very nice vector. Pi is 3 over 10, 3 over 10, 2 over 10, 2 over 10. Now, we want to use a row vector, so you can put a transpose over there. So our final result for this steady state probability is going to be 3 tenths, 3 tenths, and 2 tenths, and 2 tenths. And that's the probability vector called steady state probability 
for the Markov chain.